Welcome to the presentation of uh, use cases and functional requirements of uh, neural network watermarking. This is a project that uh, we have started a few months ago, and uh, we intended to develop uh, a standard um, for neural network watermarking. Exactly what uh, will be the standard and what kind of technologies um, MPI uh, is uh, uh, requesting uh, is the, uh, the purpose of this uh, uh, presentation. So first, the two words about, uh, about MPI. Um, MPI is a standard developing organization for AI-based data coding. It's driven by the idea that the media coding standards have made the possible the big success of digital media. And um, MPI, Moving Picture Audio and Data Coding by Artificial Intelligence, um, wants to repeat uh, the, same, uh, the same success uh, by developing standards for data coding. Data coding being the transformation of data from one format to another format that is more suitable for an application. What we do, and this is uh, what I'm going to show here, uh, is that um, we usually, we do not develop, we do not draw uh, our attention to, um, um, to monolithic standards. Uh, we, um, a focus on components that uh, can be composed into making um, complex uh, um, applica AI applications. So the basic element is called the AI module. In this case, uh, you see that uh, you have uh, a module whose function is to capture the speech of a person, convert the speech into text, but also extract the emotion that is embedded in the text. So this is an example of AI module. But if you want to make a complete, uh, say, uh, human machine conversation system, you will need more than that than this model. And this is what is represented in the next figure, where you have a workflow that is a composition of AI modules uh, with a certain function and certain input and output uh, um, data and the connection between, uh, between uh, the uh, AI models. Um, all this is executed in, uh, in an environment that we call an AI framework. Um, so you see you have uh, the, um, the AI uh, workflow with inputs and output data. And this is executed in this environment. You, ha you have a controller and uh, the AIMs can uh, make a call to the controller via API. Then we have communication, global store access and MI store. Um, so this is the set technical uh, part, which is very important, but there's another uh, important part. And that is, um, it's good to make a standards, but, uh, it's bad if the standards are not uh, available, not accessible, or they are not accessible in a timely fashion. So this is what uh, uh, Empire tries to solve before initiating a standard at the principal members developed and adopt the framework license. This is a license, but it does not contain numbers. It does not contain dollars, does not contain values of percentage don't contain dates where things happen. Um, but the framework license says that the eventual license, not the framework license, the eventual license will be issued at a price that is comparable with similar technologies and not after products are on the market. During the development, any member making contribution declares it will make its license available according to the framework license. And after the development, members holding IP in the standard that has just been developed, uh, select the preferred patent pool administrator. So these uh, one year ago were uh, dreams. Uh, this is reality. We have uh, developed uh, uh, several standards. Um, for four of them, we have uh, uh, done gone through this exercise and uh, there is 
a, a patent pool administrator uh, working with the um, patent holders uh, to develop uh, the, their final license based on the framework license. So how do we develop standards? Um, there is a, a, a proposal. Uh, Mihai, who will be speaking after me, uh, came to Empire with a proposal. And uh, I was, uh, I said, wow, by myself and other people joined. Um, then we developed use cases. Then we developed functional requirements. And this was all done in an open environment because uh, our, what we think is that standards should be developed not just to serve the needs of those who have technologies and participate in a standards organization, but they should primarily uh, serve the needs of people who will use uh, the standard. So then um, this will be a Friday uh, this week, the commercial requirements, the framework license will be uh, developed. Um, then on the 19th of July, the call for technology will be issued. Um, by the uh, 10th of um, October this year, submissions are expected, and then we will start the development and we will go to um, develop a standard. Before that, uh, we will um, seek the opinion of the community um, by asking, what do you think of what we have developed? And you know, this is a useful process because we did uh, make some changes based on, the, on what uh, the comments that we have received. So what we have done so far, we have developed five standards, as I said, and uh, we have a next round of, of MPI standards, which is uh, AI frame of version two. Uh, it is what I have described at the beginning, this environment where you can execute AI applications then we have another big uh, standard that is called multimodal conversation version two. And finally, we have neural network watermarking, uh, which is what uh, we are going to talk uh, now, but that will not be me, will be Mihai. Thank you, Leonardo. Thanks to everybody. So Mihai is speaking now. And through the next slide, we shall uh, try to present you in a nutshell our uh, work since uh, we, we started uh, this uh, working uh, uh, topic in MPAI. So first of all, why we work on uh, neural network uh, watermarking? And here we have two main reasons. First of all, is that machine learning, it's costly. Okay, we know that it's a very appealing field that young engineers and young students came to us to learn uh, AI and then go to you in industry and it's, it's a hot topic and everybody's uh, interested in. But according to some statistics, buying uh, already an off-the-shelf AI solution, it's can go as far as $300,000 and starts from somewhere around $6,000. Uh, you may also rent a pre-built uh, module and uh, for, uh, for professional level services that will cost around uh, 40 uh, k a year. Um, so all these values are in, uh, in dollars. So you see that uh, the, the providers the, of the uh, AI technology wouldn't like their uh, solution to be uh, unfairly used, to, to be hacked, to be pirated, and finally to lose the trace of their work. And uh, the second uh, point is that it's not that easy to, to precise what it's actually an uh, AI inside uh, or a neural network inside of a big end-to-end -end solution. So we may have um, 
solution combining uh, alternative neural networks to provide uh, an inference. It can be according to some service level agreement. It can be according to some type of data. It can be according to some particular usage. So you may have several blocks. And at the end, you may uh, want to know which among uh, the possible neural networks was actually used when the inference was uh, uh, provided. Uh, neural networks can be shared among multiple users. Um, I should not start now the long discussion about what a user is. It's a particular, uh, it's an individual, it's uh, one user in an entity, but different identities uh, can be hide behind uh, and so on. So keeping the track of where and how a neural network is used, it, uh, it's also useful. And uh, at a different level, um, neural network can be also altered uh, before the provider knowing it. It can, they can be embedded in, on a hardware, thus making even more difficult uh, to track them, or they can be malicious attack uh, in order to change, uh, to change the inference. Uh, just imagine what will happen with an, uh, uh, AI used in autonomous driving if it will be malicious altered. So uh, identifying modification and being able to say that the neural network was not altered uh, during uh, its usage, it's also very important. So um, our project relates to the topic of ensuring traceability and integrity of neural networks. And if we spoke about traceability and integrity, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Uh, the word uh, popping up, it's watermarking. Watermarking has uh, behind some 20, 25 year, uh, years of history in the, in the multimedia realm. Uh, but uh, to make it uh, simple, watermarking allows to imperceptibly and persistently insert some metadata into an original content. So imperceptibility means that although you insert that additional data, uh, the task uh, will be the same. So the, the neural network inferences will be not changed. The persistency uh, relates uh, or also referred to as robustness, uh, refers to the possibility of uh, keeping that metadata, detecting that metadata, although the watermark neural networks, it's changed. So uh, can't put there between watermark uh, neural network and watermark detection on this slide, a kind of uh, flashbulb uh, to show that something happens there. Uh, the, the network was changed, maybe it was inserted on a hardware, maybe it was fine-tuned, maybe it was pronged uh, or something like this. Yet the watermark should be detected. And what is here a requirement? Everybody is expected to know what is the original watermark. I mean, maybe everybody might know what are the inserted metadata. Everybody might know how the data are inserted, how data, these metadata are inserted. They may even know where they are inserted may, it's not uh, an obligation, yet the resilience, the security of the schema depends on a key that represents some a very few parameters that should be kept uh, secret. So watermarking as inherited from multimedia world means imperceptibility or fidelity. You don't change anything in the functional, in the operational functioning of the solution, means robustness or persistence. That means once you inserted it, they are there, no matter how you modify the watermark content, and means some data payload, that is how much uh, in bits the, the metadata are. Um, so uh, neural network 
watermarking, although conceptually it's inherited from the multimedia world, it's not a straightforward uh, extension from, uh, from that realm. Why? Uh, because neural networks are no longer a static content, but a dynamic one. I mean, uh, nobody tells you how much epochs you, you should train a watermark. Uh, sorry, a neural network. After uh, watermarking it, maybe somebody trying again the watermark model. Uh, so uh, the, um, the neural networks are not a static content. They are a function, right, rather than a content. And the second uh, part is that the evaluation of the impact of the watermark in a neural network functioning, it's very hard to evaluate. Um, so yeah, you, you, you insert some uh, watermark into a video, you watch the video, and even there, for all of you already, <laughs> I already had the occasion to make, you know how difficult it's to evaluate the artifacts in the video. But imagine that here, you change the watermark and that watermark ensures a classification and maybe that uh, the result of the classification changes just a little bit should not be very a very severe modification and if the task of that neural network is to tell you whether it's a cat or a dog in internet it wouldn't be a problem uh, if that task will be to tell you whether the patient is sick or not into a medical application it will be a completely different thing. If the inference will be to tell your car stop or go on, it will be a completely different thing. So it's, we cannot go straight forward and evaluate the impact of watermarking. Some general considerations should be there. So we need watermarking because it ensures traceability and it ensures fidelity, robustness, and data payload, but we cannot go straight forward and reuse uh, what uh, we developed for multimedia. Next slide, please. So um, how neural network uh, watermarking uh, uh, behaves today? It's a very rich state of the art uh, despite, despite only a four-year history. So to the best of our knowledge, the first uh, studies, uh, uh, including uh, watermarking and neural, watermarking for neural networking uh, were uh, published uh, some four years ago. So I, I precise, it's not using of, water, of neural networks for doing multimedia watermarking. No, it's watermarking neural network as we already discussed. So we, maybe it was something earlier and we couldn't find, but anyway, this is uh, something like uh, the, the topic became uh, uh, of interest uh, since 2018. And we have two, typologies of solution for neural network watermarking. Uh, first one will be the white box. So that is uh, the watermark it's applied to the neural network in itself. It assumes that, you, that the user can access the model, the parameters, and the black box that assumes that the uh, neural, uh, that the user cannot uh, uh, access the model. So the, uh, the watermark should be recovered from the inference generated by that neural network. Next slide, please. Uh, why, according to these uh, to these uh, items, uh, ne uh, neural network watermarking is a challenge? Um, the fidelity depends on the task. Uh, it's clear that the way we shall evaluate fidelity would be not the same if it's a, if the neural network it's, uh, it's, um, relates to the classification. It was the example I presented just before, and um, it's practically the case of the most of the method published in the literature. And the case when this neural network will be used, for instance, in generating uh, some speech signals starting from a text. So um, the, the, the difference uh, will be very, very uh, hard to evaluate. Maybe subjective evaluation should be combined with to objective evaluation in order to have the good results. So uh, here it's uh, really uh, a discussion uh, to be considered. 
Next click, please. The robustness, uh, the robustness should be checked against specific modification. And while uh, for uh, some of them, um, for the type of neural networks, these attacks can be a kind of, uh, let's say, generic attacks, can be mundane uh, application, mundane uh, neural network processing uh, operation. I speak here about proning, I, sp I speak here about fine tuning, about model compression or knowledge uh, distillation. This, these are operation all, uh, all uh, neural networks are likely to undergo uh, and not necessarily maliciously. You, we can go also to, to adversarial attacks and then uh, that can be uh, malicious. Data payload evaluation also differs from one to other. And uh, actually uh, in our uh, efforts, we decided I sh shall see shortly to, to keep it uh, fixed as a parameter of discussion uh, for evaluating fidelity, robustness, and next click, please. And uh, the complex, the complex. So, um, MPAI neural network watermarking will provide tools that will enable the watermarking technology providers to qualify their products. So we target the watermark technology provider and uh, not the necessarily the neural network uh, provider. Can be the same or can be, can be the same business, can be the same entity or can be different entities in the same company or can be different companies. But we, with this standard, we do not provide neural network watermarking tools. We provide tools to assess the quality of existing neural network uh, watermarking technologies. Next slide, please. Uh, so we identified the uh, use cases, um, uh, several, uh, maybe next uh, click in order to also see the, the um, yeah, the, the synopsis. Uh, so uh, we have a use case related to identify the ownership of a neural network, who owns this. To identify the neural network itself, we, we say, what if we define a kind of DOI for, uh, for a neural network? And uh, tools for verifying the integrity of a neural network. Uh, we structure them at two levels, as uh, I already stated. So is the watermarking the neural network models, the parameters, the values, or watermarking the neural network inference. Next slide, please. So the scope uh, of the MPAI uh, MNW standard is to, ena to enable uh, watermarking technology providers to qualify their products according to three items. Uh, the first uh, one is the relates to the imperceptibility. So the injection of the watermark without deteriorating the performance of uh, the neural network. And in this respect, um, a testing data set to be user for the watermark and unwatermark neural network should be provided. And an evaluation methodology to assess any change in the performances of the neural network induced by the watermark. Um, second level, it's uh, the watermark detector um, uh, capability to ascertain the presence of a watermark decoder or the, of a watermark decoder to successfully retrieve the payload of an inserted watermark. So we, we, we have here two different use cases. One is to say, yes, a watermark is there or no, a watermark is not there. It's a very binary answer. And for that, we call it watermark detector or a watermark decoder. And here we really consider multiple bit watermark. We consider that the that data payload is big and we want to, de to successfully decode all these bits inserted there. Uh, so uh, we, um, we search uh, for a list of performance criteria 
for the watermark detector and the decoder. This can be in the case of binary detection relative to the numbers of misdetection and false alarm, or in the case of the decoder can be a percentage of the retrieved payload. So we may say that uh, the procedure works with, uh, I don't know, 10 minus uh, six uh, um, bit error rate. It's, it's, it's just an example for making it uh, clear, doesn't have anything to do with the actual development of the standard. It's really just uh, uh, pedagogically speaking. We also need here a list of potential modification types expected to be applied uh, to the watermark NN, as well as their ranges. So we invoke about, uh, we invoke the fine pruning, we invoke the fine tuning, the pruning, but which percentage, to what extent and how. And the third item, it's the injection, the injection, the detector and the coder, computational cost. By computational cost, because we speak about neural networking, uh, neural networks, we cannot go in number of operation because this will be too much experimental dependent, but we shall target execution time on a given processing environment. So we shall specify processing environment and we shall measure uh, the, the execution time, the watermark uh, injector, decoder, detector and decoder required for achieving their task. Next slide, please. Uh, we have here an uh, overview of uh, the um, uh, of uh, of what we just uh, presented. It's a, it's a synoptic view. So uh, we suppose that the watermark provider uh, presented on the left of the uh, of the image uh, makes available an injector, an detector, and an decoder. Uh, again, it's not necessary in real life and from industrial needs uh, that these three components to be provided by the same company. They were cases uh, in, in multimedia realm in which the injector was uh, provided by some companies and then detector and decoder by other ones. But let's consider for, for the sake of, uh, of clarity today that these three uh, components are made available. And the MPAI tester, the, the one uh, that will exploit the, the standard we shall uh, create, uh, will evaluate, will provide tools for the um, providers to evaluate the performance of the neural net. First of all, at the injector, uh, injector uh, side, we shall evaluate the modification in performance induced by the watermark process. And we shall, um, uh, we shall uh, uh, evaluate also the processing cost. And then at the detector side, we shall be interested in providing a, a binary answer. Yes, this watermark was inserted there or no, the watermark was not inserted there even if the model is the one just watermark or it was watermark and maliciously attacked. And at the decoder level, we'll be interested in recovering precisely bit by bit the inserted information. So what we shall standardize here will be the performance criteria for the detector and decoder, as well as the processing cost of the detection decoding phase. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, the requirements are uh, structured at uh, the three levels we've just mentioned. So it's uh, requirements related to the injection or to the injector, measure the impact of the watermark on the performance. And this relates to conformance testing data set and evaluation methodology to assess the deterioration, if any, maybe the, there are no deterioration just the, by the watermark, of the quality of the inference induced by the water. So the respondent are expected to, to precise the list of tasks of interest uh, to be performed by the neural network. Uh, to comment on the process described in the call for technology. So this MXXX, uh, it's written like this because it's uh, the number will, uh, will change, but it will be made available 
when the call will be uh, released, and the method to measure the quality of the inference produced by the neural network. Next slide, please. Requirements related to watermark detection and decoding. We, we merge them on a unique slide because they are, uh, they are paired, however. So uh, measures uh, detection decoding capability means explain the process of testing the decoder, the detector and decoder of a watermark technology. And uh, here again, to identify the list of potential attacks that will be considered in the standard. The, repo the respondent are, um, respondents, sorry, are expected to list the potential modification to be applied uh, to a watermark uh, neural network parameters and ranges for that modification, and suitable distances to evaluate that, uh, that uh, uh, performance. Um, why? Because even symbol error rate have sometimes different uh, definitions, and maybe such a, such a definition is not of relevance for uh, as I explained, for uh, emotional speech synthesis, uh, starting from, uh, from a text. Next slide, please. Requirements related to the processing cost. Uh, we uh, target here the processing cost of injection, detection, and decoding in order to qualify the neural network. Uh, so the respondents are expected to suggest uh, configuration on which uh, uh, these uh, computation costs are expected to be evaluated, like CPU types, number of cores, frequency, memory, GPU types, frequency, memory, and so on. And um, some uh, how, which measure, to, to retain in order to characterize uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, parameter, uh, so this uh, item, sorry. So it can be the execution time in seconds, can be the CPU footprint in megabytes and the GPU footprint, yeah, uh, megabytes we expect it, but I know discussion it's open uh, here. Next slide, please. So uh, we are now at the beginning of this process and these are the next step, but I think Leonardo will take over and will uh, uh, present. Very it. shortly, just uh, to uh, summarize uh, that uh, um, we, on the 19th of July, we will issue uh, three calls for technologies, one for the AI framework, one for the multimodal conversation, the one for neural network watermarking. Um, the steps are here. Um, after the 19th of July, we expect uh, on the 13th of September, respondents to notify their intention to submit the proposal. This is a kind request to do it. It is not uh, compulsory uh, to do it. Uh, and if you do it uh, and you don't submit, uh, well, that, uh, you don't submit. That's all. Uh, then uh, on the 10th of October, uh, respondent are expected to make their submissions. On the 12th of October, we'll start um, evaluating the proposals and then um, start uh, drafting uh, the standard testing. I mean, everything that is needed. Sometime in spring uh, 2023, um, we plan to, um, push, uh, to publish uh, at the standard. So this uh, is um, the result. Um, so the, the only thing I want to say that uh, uh, you should join the fun and build the future. <laughs>